Content warning. Satanism, occultism, thrill killing, racism, eugenicism, BDSM, abortion, lynching, and spiritual flim flammery. Action, excitement, horror, romance, thrills and chills, swords and sorcery, rockets and ray guns, a dizzying canopy of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination. What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. You've heard me say a million times, Jack, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Failure to observe this precept is the root of all human error. It is our right and duty, the two are one, as Eliphaz Levi very nearly saw, to expand upon our own true center, to pursue the exact orbit of our destiny. To quit that orbit is to invite collisions. Suppose it is to be my illusion to think that it is my will to pass through that closed window. I bump my head, I cut my face. I finally make a mess on the boulevard. Or I think it my will to steal my neighbor's watch. I am caught, police, court, prison, and general disaster. Merely the result of my ignorance in regard to my true destiny. Failure in life, and especially criminal failure, collision. Then there is the original collision. In myself, there is a conflict between my conscious will and my unconscious will. Between the sophisticated babble of reason and the still small voice of the soul. Edward Alexander Crowley was born in 1875, eventually changing his name to Alistair Crowley, then later changing it again to Freder Perderavo, uh, Edward Kelly, Baphomet, and a legion of others. He was also known as the Great Beast and the wickedest man in the world, presumably by his enemies, uh, though it can be hard to tell with him. He eventually became a writer, poet, mountaineer, double agent, and most significantly, magician. In fact, Crowley is largely responsible for shaping how the role of magician is perceived and helping to give the term a meaning other than stage illusionist or fairy tale wizard. Of course, Crowley's thinking in art can be a little esoteric, literally, uh, but it had a tremendous impact on everything from counterculture movements to comic books. Crowley claimed to have created the famous V for Victory symbol during World War II. Uh, he drew up a tarot deck. And his vision of magic, spelt with a K, influenced the spiritualism of the 1960s and thus pop culture down to the present day. In addition to his magical writings, Crowley wrote fiction, partly to disperse his ideas to a wider audience, but also to keep himself afloat financially. At the end of World War I, he produced a series of detective stories about a sort of mystic Sherlock Holmes named Simon F., who eventually became a key character in his novel Moonchild. So on this Halloween episode of What Mad Universe, we'll be driving, diving into the somewhat spooky supernatural world of Simon F. I'm Philip Rice, and with me always is Adam Prosser. Hello! Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs> Happy Halloween! <laughs> yes. Not that this this actually isn't anywhere as spooky as I was anticipating it to be. <laughs> it's, you were it's anticipating more spookiness? Well, I don't know. I thought, you know, he's 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 seen as sort of a sinister figure, and there's a lot of, you know, one might apply to satanic. Before I started reading the stories, I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a bit of a it's it's all he's an occultist, right? So yeah. I mean, there's that yeah, kind of thing. He didn't actually worship Satan except in jest. Right, right. Well, that is actually kind of crucial. Yes, exactly. Um, there's a he's he was he he's clearly a guy who. Uh, enjoyed the perception of being sinister and uh, an evil figure who was opposed to everything society stood for, and he liked that mystique. Uh, mm -hmm. But he, you know, he didn't actually 
you know, embrace Satanism per se. In fact, I mean, he had his whole, his own, his own philosophy. That's actually something about Satanism that I always found a bit ironic, not to, not to claim I'm knowledgeable about Satanism, but you know, you, you're, you're saying, oh yeah, I worship Satan, but you're essentially acknowledging the theolo theology of the people you're opposing, you're just taking the opposite path, right? It's, you're just saying, I'm a, I'm a Satanist, but I believe in everything in the Bible. I just do the opposite, basically. Well, it depends. The Church of Satan, I think, doesn't actually recognize any of that. But Yeah, I, I did know that, that they say, yeah, oh yeah, but we don't actually worship Satan. But then I'm like, okay, so why are you calling yourself Satanist, right? Like, on some level, at least, there's a yeah, we're taking this name because it shocks people that we're Satanists and we're, we're opposed to, you know, what we're told is good and we're trying to invert morality, you know what I mean? So, mm. or so something, uh, well, go on, sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah, Crow, Crowley was very much that in terms of his uh, his right. public pers uh, the, his public persona. Right, yes. And I mean, he, but, but I mean, he created his whole, his whole own sort of mythos and his whole uh, philosophy Yeah, religion, the uh, dilemma. Yeah. Dilemma, yeah. Which, so basically, he was willing to sort of say, no, it's, you know, it's not a binary choice. He was <laughs> philosophically non-binary, you might say. Um, so it's just sort of, it's not, you know, the morality is different from what we, uh, we assume it to be, which I always find more interesting than, than just, yeah, I'm Satan, uh, you know, Satanists are always kind of knobs, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, uh, he had a supernatural uh, entity called uh, uh, Awas. Right. Uh, a I W A S S. Um, you mentioned that last week, and I, I couldn't recall the name offhand. Um, he also had yeah. a um, trinity of uh, Egyptian-based gods: uh, Nuit, Hadit, and Rahur Kuit. So uh, uh, Nuit is the uh, sky goddess. Uh, that's an actual Egyptian goddess. Uh, mm. And in Thelema, she represents the infinite. Hadith represents, um, is sort of an original thing based on other gods, but uh, uh, represents the point in the heart of all things and in every star, and you know. So it's mm. like the infinite and the finite. And then uh, Rahur Kuit is uh, son of uh, Horus, who's sort of. Uh, okay, all right. I'm not quite one. sure what that means, but yeah, whatever. Well, I mean, Horus is a big thing in his writings, but sorry, yeah. just go, going back to Thelema for a minute. You, sorry, sorry, Thelema is an original, it's a, it's the name of the goddess, you said. No, Thelema is the religion, it just means will. Um, right, okay. So it actually, uh, and I found out this uh, recently, uh, he drew it from, um, or the name and some of the philosophy from uh, Francois, Francois Rabelais' uh, Gargantuan Pentagoril oh, series, okay. which All are right. tall tales from the 16th century. Mm -hmm. um, Written in, uh, I, I'd like to do an episode on this someday because I've only yeah. read two of them so far. There's five. Um, they're very body. They're they're absolutely filthy. Um, but they also uh, they're they're about two giants from Utopia who mm -hmm. travel the world and have various adventures. Uh, and in the first book, uh, the giant Gargantua founds the Abbey of Telem, uh, where the only rule is do what thou wilt. Oh, okay. uh, it, it, Rabelais interprets this a little differently. Uh, he believed that men who are free are uh, well-bred and um, whatnot, uh, have uh, intrinsic honor, which leads them to hmm. virtuous actions, uh, and constrain their noble natures, turn instead to remove their servitude, because men desire what they are denied. Hmm. But yeah, so it's basically the, the idea that... Um, uh, good people will just act good without rules. Yeah. Huh. That's it, very interesting. Yeah, of course, that does line up with what Crowley wrote in these Well, a little different, because he has the, the idea of uh, a true will, which is basically one's destiny. Right. Yeah, he, we, he suggests that, as we said in that, in that little intro piece, like, you can say, well, you just do whatever you want, but it's like, yeah, you don't just do whatever you want, because you're probably acting in contrariness to what you're actually meant to be doing and what you secretly I, the way I read it was you have a secret will that's like deep down and that you don't necessarily understand he yeah yeah to, part of the the rituals of dilemma are discovering your true will right yeah he seemed to be uh somewhat influenced by psychology uh as we see in the the later Simon if stories uh yeah. and just it's that idea of you know people don't necessarily know what they want which I guess was sort of 
starting to really come into flower around the turn of the century uh, when he was writing, um, because up till then people would have just assumed, you know, people didn't have as much uh, understanding of the subconscious. And that's sort of what he's writing about. It's like, you have to understand your subconscious. You have to understand what you really want and who you really are. And then you can act on your will. So it's not just, yeah. you know, uh, Hey, I, I feel like eating 500 chocolate sundaes and you'll get sick and be like, why didn't my will work out? It's like, well, you you weren't, <laughs> you weren't really in balance with what you're supposed to understand. Um, but there is an element as well of, of Crowley's writings that I noticed because he was, you know, he was a member of the upper class and, you know, he was rich. He went oh, to Cambridge. Uh, it's Crowley rhymes with oh, Holy. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, yeah, it's, sorry. it's hard to because everybody <laughs> pronounces it wrong, basically. Um, right. Crowley well, we is just, the basis just... for a number of characters in fiction, including Supernatural and Good right. Omens and so on. But most of them just yeah. pronounce it wrong. Right. Well, didn't but, I think uh, actually in Good Omens they did pronounce it Crowley? I think. Uh, yeah, Good Omens um, is correct. Uh, but uh, I think Supernatural is wrong, and uh, uh, the song Mister Crowley by Black Sabbath uh, uses it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. But uh, I did double check before this episode. Uh, Crowley was fond of rhyming his name with Holy in various mm, poems. So yeah, that's, that's definitely it. But uh, anyway, but Crowley was yeah he was definitely part of the the sort of upper class. Uh, he went to Cambridge. He was a, you know, a rich, rich kid, basically. And in fact, he he was a bit of an extravagant spence thrift uh, so that he actually went, he he started going broke around the time he was writing the Simon If stories. And apparently that's part of what motivated him to write, because otherwise he was writing poetry and really high minded esoteric stuff. And then uh, he wrote these books, which are sort of Sherlock Holmes type mysteries, uh, I guess, because the idea was that could make him a few bucks uh, because he'd been living beyond his means, which tended to afflict a lot of these, uh, these wealthy people. But anyway, there's, there's definitely a very, um, I think a bit of an arrogance and a, you know, upper class looking down his nose at people aspect to a lot oh, of his Oh, very books. much so, yes. Yeah. And and it was, and, and there is a very much of, uh, you say that he's different from the Pantagruel thing where he's, you know, oh, you know, uh, men of nobility have, but I feel like he buys into that, even though if he doesn't explicitly say it. Um, the same way it's like he, he it's the vision of someone who has all the freedom to do whatever they want they can understand what they want and they have the base nobility it's not about you know the average person doing that again he doesn't say you can't but he, he, he frames it as you know well because i had the wealth to travel around the world and study esoteric philosophy i can you know understand my my true nature which is of course a problem right up till today the idea that self-improvement uh, self improvements for, as they might be giant said, alienations for the rich. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that idea? But um, um, so let's just talk about the stories a bit. Um, uh, yeah, Simon If is sort of um, often viewed as a um, idealized older version of Crowley himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in his eighties. Uh, one story suggests that uh, there's rumors that he has the elixir of life because he's sort of youthful. This, like he looks old, but like he has the vigor of youth. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing that um, the Sar Dub Notel stories, uh, an occult detective from France, um, or from written in France, um, does have the uh, elixir of youth and uses it on him and his assistants. Hmm. So he's actually much uh, older than he looks. Huh. But that's a well, different there's, there's, that's mean, a different kind of character entirely because he's an actual you know like he does mysteries, but there are ghosts and stuff that he communicates with to you know get clues and things. So. Which always struck me as a bit of a cheat, right? Yeah, that's a, that's always an issue with when you get supernatural into a detective story. It's like okay, but you know the super the detective stories, you know, they solve like Sherlock Holmes himself, for instance. He would often deal with what seemed to be supernatural, but then there'd be you know a rational explanation, which there has to be for him to use his detective powers. If it's a supernatural thing and oh, just magic happens, then it's yeah. not really a detective story anymore. It, it could it's, work it's if you different. have firmly established, right. Yeah, okay. And then there was the, uh, what was the, oh, I've forgotten his name now, the guy from around the same period, Karnaki. Uh, Karnaki. That's yeah. yeah, that's another one um, you might look at. Oh, he was interesting because um, uh, I've only read uh, uh, a smattering, but uh, uh, basically the idea is they're not always supernatural stories. Sometimes they're hoaxes. So it doesn't mm, fall right. into the Scooby-Doo, it's always a hoax thing, but it also <laughs> isn't the, the later day X-Files where it's always supernatural, you know? La the other thing is, last week uh, we talked about uh, G.K. Chesterton, um, and he wrote the Father Brown stories, 
uh, which are, um, you know, about, and it's funny because having read them myself, I know you haven't read them, Phil, but, um, there, there's a lot of similarities to what the Simon If stories are. Uh, ironically, the Simon If stories, except for Moonchild itself, uh, don't have anything supernatural in them. He uses, um, like his magic and his philosophy to solve the crimes. Uh, his understanding but, of human nature, basically. Mm-hmm, exactly. It's it's more. It it's almost him admitting <laughs> in a weird way. I I almost feel like uh, Cro- Crowley had to say, um, uh, you know, oh yeah, I'm magic. I can do magical things, and I have magical abilities because that was the mystique he was building up. But via these fictional stories, he's almost admitting, oh, you know, you know, I don't actually magically do things. What I do is I influence psychology and I influence culture and I influence people to think what I what I say, <laughs> and this is yeah, how I do it. It's always a bit confusing reading his stuff, whether or not he actually thinks he can like cast spells and things. Right, right. Because because as you say, as or I say, it's there's... a metaphor. It's kind of because uh, uh, like like you said, the Simon F stories. Like he uses a gun at one point to to defend himself. Um, but right. In Moonchild, he has actual like maybe not D and D, you know, casting magic missile powers but you know he has more right. explicit um magical abilities but even that we'll see that's the interesting thing because the big magical moment in um in uh, moonchild because even moonchild you could kind of describe describe it as psychological um like well, they there's see a part it- where somebody does a sword dance and kills somebody at a distance um, yeah, but, but you can always peg it to sort of like, well, the universe made that happen. Like that's kind of his, his explanation for everything is just like, you're kind of, you know, he talks about Taoism and, um, like the way of the Tao, which is, uh, Simon If's way of doing things. And it, it almost talks about like, yeah, the, if you, if you understand your will and you go with the Tao, which is the, the go with the flow, basically, um, the universe will sort things out. Um, uh, the big moment to me in Moonchild is there's this uh, this thing they call the what is it the beast in the thing in the garden uh, this some kind of monstrous creature described as an eyeless dog if I recall correctly um, comes into the garden uh, to attack them and it's being sent by the Black Lodge yes the Black Lodge <laughs> um, who are their sort of their opposite number of the cabal of white magicians who are the heroes um, and uh, it's basically a big monstrous apparition. And Simon If fights it by walking into it and basically absorbing it. Um, and the way it's spelled out, it's almost like, well, you have magical sensibilities, so your mind translates, you know, the currents of the universe into this vision, which if then, if it then goes against by uh, by sort of accepting it and drawing it into himself and then how did it work exactly? He turned it against the people who who uh, were trying to I, use it on him. I read that two years ago. Sorry, it's a little, <laughs> a little well, big. It's, yeah, like it, it's it, the the basic idea is just that um, it, it, uh, the idea of sort of if there's a demon, it can't hurt you if you accept your own you know kinship with it. That you accept mm-hmm. you have demons inside you. Uh, oh, and yeah, you, I and think you, there was a uh, come to think of it, I think there was a similar thing in Promethea with the um, right. Uh, the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Demons of the Ars Goetia, where she just uh, sort of eats them. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. Alan Moore is very clearly influenced by uh, Crowley. As I'm reading this, I'm like, yeah, okay. The ideas in, especially Promethea and Alan Moore's magical uh, comics, are very clearly uh, influenced by Crowley's ideas. Oh, and uh, I, I have a joke. Uh, there's a thing here. Uh, Crowley once said, uh, "To know, to do, and to keep silent." And Alan Moore responded. Uh, Crowley had the first two down pat. <laughs> so he never, sh- you know, because Crowley never, never shut, shut up shut about up. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I th- well, as we were saying, though, he, he, um, he, he, uh, in some ways, because he was building a mystique, I almost feel like what he meant by keep silent was, you know, I didn't tell anyone my real things. I just created a mystique of becoming a master magician and the wickedest man in the world. And that was all, you know, my, my, uh, persona that I built up. Uh, whereas what I was really doing is sort of kept a secret. I, that's how I would interpret that maybe. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I just thought that was funny. So no, you're right. He's clearly full of himself. This guy, uh, even Alan and, Moore um, was like, was in Promethea. Yeah. He basically says, 
one of the characters goes, you know, well, Crowley, wasn't he like evil? And I think uh, the, the character responds, no, nah, he was just kind of lost and confused, but he had some ideas. Like, it, he, he, even Alan Moore doesn't totally respect Crowley, even though he uses a lot of ideas and he's clearly uh, influenced by him. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he used um, um, him as a, well, a, a version of him as a villain in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Right, right. But but that was the same character who was created by Somerset Mom. Somerset Mom, Mom yeah. So uh, tell us about I that. this week, uh, mm-hmm. The Magician. Um, right. It was written in, uh, or published at least, in uh, 1908. Uh, Somerset Mom had briefly met Crowley and uh, didn't take kindly to him. Uh, so later on, uh, wrote a book about, uh, with Crowley as, like a caricature of Crowley as the villain. Um and he has actual magic powers in the story. Um, and he uh, wants to create life, sort of a homunculus thing, and ends up creating these deformed, you know, parodies of humanity at the end through human sacrifice. That's interesting. I didn't realize there was actual supernatural stuff in uh, The Magician. Uh, Mom... Yeah, even that, it's played uh, mostly, like, uh, subtly. But uh, mm-hmm. it's clear he at least has some alchemical, you know, like putting potions together and making things and so forth. Right. It, it is interesting to me how from like the late Victorian era through till sometime around, well, even the fifties or sixties, uh, pop culture kind of went back and forth on whether it was okay to portray the outright supernatural or not. Um, and, and uh, you mentioned Scooby-Doo. Oh, yeah, it's pre Victorian era, the, the Gothic writers, like we mentioned with, um, mm-hmm. um, uh, Anne Radcliffe didn't like, explained away supernatural things right although there were well no i mean if you go gothic there's there's ghosts and there's demons and things like that. yeah yeah but uh radcliffe in particular would uh sort of always come up with a flimsy explanation for some supernatural event that happened right right but by the late victor and of course sherlock holmes same thing it was very much no let's uh and i think a harry houdini might have been uh, an impetus for that because he was a big debunker of the supernatural and he was a very popular figure uh, when he was uh, active. Uh, so it almost feels, and, and so when I'm reading this book, uh, which is uh, late, like the tail end of World War One, I, I feel like there was a sense of, you know, oh yeah, you can't just write a supernatural story. It has to be, uh, it has to be debunked. So that might have influenced Crowley's um, uh, thinking in writing the story that like, oh, I can't just write a, a supernatural <laughs> story about ghosts and goblins. It has to be, you know, there has to be something subtler. Um, I, I was and then just it's admit- interesting that he's sort of, with Moonchild, although it is subtle, there it's more explicit. Right. Um, so it's mm-hmm. sort of, and it, I think it was um, actually uh, Moonchild was written among the Simon F stories. It was written after the right. first batch, but before uh, the Simon F in America stories, at least from my understanding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, he was writing it all. He wrote the first batch. Uh, I think I think you're right. I think it was that first book of stories. Uh, then he wrote Moonchild. Then he kept writing the Simon. F- and he wrote Moonchild in America as well. Um, it what's it's kind of interesting that um, uh, he. I, I almost feel like the stories were meant to be more commercial, whereas Moonchild he could get a little goofier. Like it was like stories you have to publish them in magazine. You have to get it through an editor who's maybe a little more populist. The magazines that publish short sto- short fiction, both then and now there's kind of a, well, we're looking for this specifically, you know, like they publish that. Whereas if you can get a novel published, it's probably, I feel like there's a bit more of a, a, a freedom from an editor to, I mean, not, of course, they're going to still give you guidance, but, you know, he'd already written all these very strange esoteric books and published them. Uh, although I think he self-published a lot of them um, because he had money at the time. Um, whereas the short stories, it was kind of like, yeah, I've got to, you know, sell a, a story to a magazine to make some money, basically. So he uh, may also have been... the Simon If stories were written under a pen name, right, uh, right, Edward it, it... Kelly, which is uh, based on a, a real life uh, uh, mystic from the Elizabethan era, who was the assistant of uh, John D. Right. Uh, it's spelled yeah. differently. He spells Kelly differently, but it's clearly what is, <laughs> yeah to throw them off the scent. Yeah, supposedly he. Um, he he actually claimed he was Edward Kelly, uh, a reincarnation of Edward Kelly. He said he always he always had a uh, uh, a strong relationship with that historical. Fi- he didn't he didn't claim to be John D. He claimed to be <laughs> John D.'s yeah, assistant. I, basically, that's interesting because um, yeah, I heard that as well. Um, Kelly, from my understanding, was kind of a scumbag. So, hmm. like in well, his again, real life or it, something like that. 
that may be a, a, a bit of his, uh, his little subversiveness coming out again, uh, Crowley's that is, uh, because he's like, yeah, he was a scumbag. Well, you know, cause I think he's challenging morality in a lot of this. Mm-hmm. He's trying to say, you know, well, what you think is a scumbag is not necessarily a scumbag, right? Yeah. John D was more, I don't know, um, presentable, even though he was a mystic, like he, he gave, uh, Queen Elizabeth the first, uh, horoscope, for example. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was, he was, he kind of, he, he was the, he's in some ways the archetype of the court sorcerer, right? Like he, he yeah. attended on the, literally the queen and, and the nobles and everything. So he had some respectability. Uh, whereas you get people like Nostradamus, who was very clearly a flim flam artist yeah. and he found a new grift, which was, well, I mean, you know, predicting uh, uh, well, John D too. I mean, let's face well, it, Enochian sure. is, uh, the, the language just is English grammar right. with different words. So. Yeah. Right. Well, no, I mean, but when I say Nostradamus, he was literally coming out of being like, like, literally, he was a con artist before he became a magician, right? Mm-hmm. Like, D, maybe John D was too. I always got the impression he had a bit well, more of a presentability. John D definitely. I, I, I got the impression Edward Kelly was more in that vein. So. Right. Right. Like it's it, you know you're a gr- you're a small time grifter and then you find the and even you know sorry sorry to say it but uh, Joseph Smith uh, who created. Uh, uh, Mormonism, like he was literally a flim flam artist, and then one day he said, "An angel spoke to me and gave me these magic tablets, which you can't see." And you know, like oh, that it, happens so much. Um. Mm-hmm. um, but anyway, just to go back to the stories, uh, I do find it interesting that, um, uh, so yeah, I mentioned G.K. Chesterton, so he wrote the Father Brown stories, um, and those are detective stories in which, again, the supernatural is often debunked by Father Brown. Um, and, uh, even though he's a priest and it deals with spiritual stuff and a lot of the times it's like a demon killed this man and then he'll debunk it and say, no, it was just, you know, it was some kind of, uh, clever flim flam that happened. Uh, and, and it made me go, wow. Uh, even though Crowley and, um, Crowley and, and Chesterton would have not seen eye to eye philosophically at all. Uh, they've written something very similar in that they've used a detective fiction, uh, as a way of exploring higher spiritual matters while simultaneously debunking, you know, the base superstition and base supernatural stuff. Um, and, and again, it's and putting in their, their philosophy. So I thought that was actually really interesting. I, and may, again, maybe that was a whole genre at the time. Maybe it was the, I mean, as we say, Sherlock Holmes debunked the supernatural a lot too. So maybe that was, as I say, he's clearly a student of Jungian psychology as well. That comes up in a lot of the stories. Oh yeah, there's there's a later uh, one of the Simon F stories where um, he basically uh, figures out a motive by reading the uh, perpetrator's uh, poetry, right? Interpreting it through a Jungian lens, and it just made me think of like uh, Jordan Peterson PI or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, then, so when you go through the 20th century, you have Jung, and then you have Joseph Campbell, and then you maybe have a few other people, and then. Jordan Peterson, he's kind of the <laughs> third or fourth generation photocopy of these ideas, which were a little bit, even with Young, they're a little bit maybe dodgy. <laughs> some of the ideas, there's some merit to them, but there's still yeah. a sense of, it's but not once very... You, once you get to Peterson, it gets really dodgy. <laughs> right. Which, um, well, speaking uh, of grifters, Controversy. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, it's um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it, but in, in the story you're mentioning, what's interesting is that that's the psychic, what's it called? Psychic, uh, comp, psychic compensation. Um, but the, the perpetrator in that has not been arrested or anything. She's literally committed suicide and it's him, you know, cracking the case afterwards and saying what, what happened in the situation, uh, because people were kind of baffled about what happened. That, that's what happened, right? She committed suicide. Yeah. Right? Um. That's actually yeah. an interesting thing about these stories. Um, like in some Sherlock Holmes stories, he'd let uh, the perpetrator go because he felt sorry for them or mm-hmm. something like that. But th- it happens a lot in, in the Simon If stories. Yeah. Like he doesn't. Uh, he sometimes rely. He sometimes works with the police, but for the most part, he's just sort of letting things. You know, um, like uh, in the first story, he sort of talks somebody into uh, becoming so paranoid. He goes into a mental asylum. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just by talking with him, uh, because he committed a crime. But he lets the other guy who committed the same crime go because he had a different attitude about it. <laughs> right. Well, the guy who, yeah. So that's the thing. He he uh, he believes in the way of the Tao, 
which is, again, that whole idea that things just sort of work out. If you understand your internal will and you go with it and you can maybe manipulate it and nudge it, but even then you're manipulating the will of the cosmos, as it were. Um, the two people, it's two people who basically make an agreement to murder people because they're rich and are like, we can murder. Oh, yeah, it reminded want. me of the, the thrill killers, like the thing that uh, Rope was based on, which was right. a, a thing in the 20s or something. I yeah. can't remember. Learn, uh, I want to say Lerner Oh, Leopold and Loeb. And Loeb. Leopold and Loeb. Yeah, that's it. That's after Crowley was writing, right? Yeah, like it was, yeah. It was, it was, he was anticipating it rather than yeah, uh, yeah. reacting to it. Yeah, uh, yeah and, that's what and, I meant. But, it's sort of, um, but he, he sort of at least understood that there were people out there who were willing to do thrill killings and that sort of thing. Yeah, and that they were rich, you know, it was because they were, one's a lawyer, and are they both lawyers? I can't remember. Uh, uh, one's a lawyer. One's a lawyer, the other, oh, what was the one who survived? I don't think he was a lawyer. I think he was a poet. Right. Well, the, that's the funny thing, because Flynn then ends up hanging around and becoming an, an associate of Ifs, even though he murdered yeah. these people. And it's because he, the people he murdered, he basically chose to murder some people who had themselves committed murder and escaped the noose. Uh, so he basically was uh, instituting justice. And that's why If kind of lets him go. And If basically says, well, you were right. You did the right thing. You you know, these people were horrible and they deserve to die. Whereas uh, the other guy, um, uh, Fisher, what's his name? Um, Anyway, the, I can't remember. Yeah, the 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 guy, the 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 lawyer. He is literally just. I mean, he's a psychopath. Uh, he just says, "Oh, it'd be fun if I could kill someone, and there'd be no motive, so no one would ever catch me. I'd just randomly murder someone." And then, as you say, Simon If basically figures it out. Like he, through implication, as he meets Simon If, uh, Simon basically tells him, "You know, well, but anyone who did that would never get a night's sleep again because he'd be worried the same could happen to him at any time." And that thinking about that drives him insane and. You know, <laughs> so so he gets side of psychic revenge essentially on this guy, which is kind of uh, cool. yeah. And that happens again later with the with a woman who uh, commits uh, a crime, and he lets her like not just lets her get away with it. He uh, makes a fake alibi, I think. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the which is kind of neat. I think it's it's you know, like I say, it's the way of the Tao. He ca he doesn't have a lot of uh, faith in you know, the institutions of justice or anything, yeah. which is He does of work fun. with the police commissioner in, in the American stories, but it always seems like he's, you yeah. know, just like convenience. Right. It's sort of maybe the police are going to be the instruments of justice, but I don't count on them to be automatically, basically. Mm -hmm. um, there's the um, one where um, uh, he basically, he finds, he, there's a guy trying to kill him because he's sort of tangentially related to this uh, giant murder plot. There's a prince who faked his death and is now you know, waiting for his chance to return to high society. And uh, Simon basically goes, well, I'm just going to go along with it and everything will work out. And it does. And it's oh, sort he of not just goes along with it. Like when he gets kidnapped, he actually just starts spilling all his secrets without even being tortured first. And, right. and the prince is just flabbergasted and doesn't understand what's going on. Right. And, and it, it, the, of course, the, the benefit he gets is he doesn't have to be tortured. But then the other thing is that because he's given these sequels or these secrets, to the prince, uh, the prince then realizes when the authorities catch him, they basically have to kill him because he knows too much. So yeah. he's basically doomed himself by finding out these secrets, right? So it's, yeah, there's a lot of that. He uses words and psychology to basically trip everyone up uh, rather than, you know, the, and and in that case, the police burst in and, and save him. Uh, <laughs> so again, but again, they're seen as an instrument, not as, oh yeah, this and, is what And he also do. set up like... Um... Uh, there, there's a woman who appears in a lot of these stories who's sort of a, not quite a detective, but, you know, interested in mysteries and things. Right. And he sort of put her on She's... the case by telling her not to get involved. And that was based and so on... he was had faith that she would save him, basically. Yeah, exactly. She knew in her nature she would... He said, don't do anything, which would make her of course, come to his rescue and save him. And <laughs> so it was, it was all sort of manipulation. And, she, and that character was based on Crowley's, uh, girlfriend, right? Who was a reporter. If uh, I'm not no, no, that that's another character. Oh, okay. There, there were, um, there's two female characters in these Simon, if in America stories that are, that keep recurring. Um, one second, right, Molly and, and, uh, and Molly Madison is a reporter who is based on a, uh, real life, uh, reporter and, uh, an ex lover of his. And the other is uh, Dolores Cass, who I think is probably based on somebody he knew, but uh, uh, right. she's uh, somebody who uh, uh, faked um, her death and then had a double impersonator, and uh, if sort of uh, unravels her 
um, because it was all a big publicity stunt for a book she was writing. And uh, if sort of unravels it, but they become friends afterwards, and she appears in a couple other stories. Yeah, the people who are involved in the murders, even as the, quote, suspects, although sometimes they're seen to be decent people, but they end up hanging around and becoming his friends, basically, which is like that guy, like Flynn, the, the, the guy I was mentioning earlier on. Um, um, oh, uh, something we, we should have brought up earlier, I think. Uh, these stories are really racist in, at points. Yeah, he he um, he embraces a, a, literally a eugenicist uh, viewpoint at one point. Yeah, uh, which was didn't. And it, the thing with Crowley is you have to feel like a lot of what he says is very ironic and he's almost saying one thing and meaning the opposite, uh, you know. So sometimes you and and like I say, he's doing it to be sort of sinister and build up a mystique. So sometimes you kind of want to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's just saying it to be. But I think, unfortunately, at that point, um, like he, he has a whole uh rant against race mixing basically or a character does but simon if agrees with him basically yeah. uh it's uh, that, really oh, uncomfortable that whole story basically yeah that was really uh and and unfortunately i don't think you can give him the benefit of the doubt that he was you know trying to trying to you know expose people it's so ironic that he's a guy who's like i'm exposing the hypocrisies and i'm subverting traditional morality but you know oh but the races shouldn't mix like it's like that's the most retrograde <laughs> attitude you yeah. can have well it's like we we keep bringing up you know the, the hippies in the 60s were you know in mm-hmm. a lot of ways pushing against society but also in a lot of ways you know upholding mm-hmm. it for their own benefit right and i mean it, it is also interesting because it, he has some good female characters in this, as we mentioned. He has a couple of female sidekicks who are kind of interesting in their own right. But there's still a real undercurrent of sexism to all the stories. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. And in fact, he had his own, his real life uh, relationships were a little bit messed up. He was apparently into some, you know, S&M type stuff and, and uh, or BDSM as they call it. And he, you know, he he tended to he seemed to get off on mistreating women, but then at the same time, he also seemed to get off on the idea of elevating women to st- letting them do things that were considered, you know, not polite for proper society. Um, and of course in the, in the, you know, immediate before and after world war two era, there was a bit of a boom of, you wouldn't call it feminism, but women were kind of seen as, you know, and the sophisticated upper classes were seen as like, uh, they, they were sometimes allowed to be semi-equals with the men. Uh, you know, there were a lot of good female writers and sophisticates and so forth. Uh, and he, he... Oh yeah, the, the aforementioned uh, uh, Dolores Cass gets married over the course of the stories, and uh, he sort of is slightly disapproving, and he subtly convinces her to get a divorce, and she does, and he's right, glad about right. it. So that's but, uh, interesting. Right. Well, at the same, but then at the same time, just getting a divorce would be oh, what a horrible thing to to earlier and even some later generations. You know, it would be as the shocking thing. But it was all seen as like an so there's embrace embrace of you know modernity compared to some other things that happened both before and later in that era in terms of uh, feminism and and equality of the sexes. But he also clearly likes the idea of like he he literally. Doesn't he literally like slap a woman at one point and kind of put her in her place? And you know, there's I can't a bit of that. that, but probably. <laughs> yeah, actually, you, you know what? I don't think. Again, I don't think it's Simon himself who does anything of that. It's just other characters do it, and there's a slight you sense approval from Crowley. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. Which is kind of having his cake and eating it too, because he's letting Simon be. You know, the the people knew Simon that would be bad, at, even at the time. You know, people would go, "Oh, that's you know, that's a bad thing to do. That's not that's not proper." Um, but he still gets to sort of get off on the immorality of it. <laughs> it's the classic mm-hmm. problem with a lot of fiction where, you know, sure, you, you're you disapprovingly portraying behavior, but you could still be kind of going, but isn't it fun to watch, you know, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last story, which I don't think you got to, right? The, no, I didn't read the, the final sterilized story. Sterilized Stephen. Um, it features a, uh, a woman who's been, um, uh, who had a, a rough life uh, because she... Uh, got pregnant and had an abortion and um, uh, was sort of ostracized and eventually became homeless and, and uh, sex worker and, you know, living on the streets. And uh, her brother was like uh, clean and proper and, you know, wouldn't even like get himself dirty. He was obsessed with wearing gloves all the time and so forth. And Simon clearly, um, uh, the, the brother gets killed. Anyway, um, but Simon clearly uh, puts her as more moral than he is because she uh, 
the circumstances of her life led her to doing various things, but, you know, she didn't, like, yeah, right. anyway. Right, and then that happens again in Moonchild to an extent, right? The, the villain uh, basically takes his wife, who's pure and innocent, and degrades her and turns her out on the street and does all kinds of horrible things to her. Eventually, uh, as you say, uh, he's actually going to give her an abortion, which is, the, the plot of Moonchild is uh, Cyril Gray, another Crowley stand-in, although a younger one, uh, wants to create uh, the Moonchild, who is a fabled, uh, you know, sort of messianic An incarnation figure. of the moon spirit, basically. Right, yeah, kind of a, yeah, kind of a messianic figure. Um, and they want to do this ritual to bring it about. Uh, and the Black Lodge is trying to uh, to sabotage them by literally having an equivalent uh, woman who's the main guy's wife, and she's gotten pregnant, so he's going to give her an abortion as part of a magical ritual, which is going to cause her to miscarry and 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 fail. And it seems like Crowley's views on abortion are pretty retrograde. Like he seems to see it as he literally calls it, oh, it's a great evil. It's akin to murder at one point in Moonchild, although he kind of talks around it, but that's what he's discussing. Um, uh, so he had. Yeah, uh, abortion was a very complicated. Uh, right. Like early feminists were, were against it, the, the right. um, suffragettes, because it was often used, like it was more dangerous than it is now. Um, right. Right. And also it was often used, it's... uh, men forcing women to do it, uh, mm -hmm. which isn't the case anymore as much as people say it is, but yeah. Right. Well, in this case, it is literally a man forcing a woman to do yeah. it. And it was seen as, it's seen as a sign of how evil Douglas the villain is because he's telling her, you know, you should get an abortion as part of a magical ritual. It's not even to do with you. Although he, he doesn't like that she's pregnant either, but you know, <laughs> so, you know, Crowley keeps trying to sort of subvert morality, but then he keeps like, he almost subverts it so much. He comes back around in some ways to, yeah. Back uh, on the race thing. One of the American stories has him, has Simon if witnessing a lynching and not really doing anything or not doing anything. Right. Well, to and be, I mean, to be fair, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't approve, but he also doesn't do anything. Right. Well, that, that, I mean, that's the character. He doesn't, he doesn't just do the people who perform the lynching. Do they end up like struck down by lightning or something bad happens uh, to them later? I can't remember. Sorry. That, that just, that scene struck out to me. Um, yeah. Well, I, I mean, well, that shows you what I'm talking about. Like it, it's true. Like that's true to the character. He doesn't, you know, catch criminals. He lets them kind of hoist by their own petard and maybe he'll nudge them slightly to destroy themselves psychologically, but he won't, you know, take action specifically. Uh, but that also, as you're saying, like if something horrible, if some horrible injustice is happening, like a lynching, uh, you know, you have a, you have a, a, an obligation to act and do something. You can't just sit there and go, well, I'm moral and the universe will take care of it. You know, that's obviously going to create horrible problems. So that does kind of display the limits of uh, Crowley's style of thought, I think, and Simon Ifs. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't look to him to be this anti-imperialist, anti-racist kind of guy, unfortunately. Oh, no, no, definitely not. Uh, I mean, he was, he was a product of his upbringing, I think, his yeah. uh, sort of rich, you know, um, like you went to Eton or something, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. He went like he went to Cambridge. As you say, um, um, I think you nailed it when you said, you know, it, the 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 tendency towards self actualization and psychic improvement that we then saw in like the '60s and and has run through counterculture, but where it's an expression of privilege, and that very much, I would say, goes uh, back to Crowley because he was, you know, he had the privilege to do that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. It is interesting because he worked. He literally worked for World War Two, and like again, he's he's claiming to be this oh, sort World of World War One. Yeah, he was. Um, he was involved in. Um, uh, he he infiltrated the pro-German movement in England and spied for the British government. Yeah, yeah. He was he, apparently he was the editor of the pro-German paper uh, in America, not in 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 England oh, okay. uh, during World War One. Uh, no, he did both. You're right. He had, he was in, in England, he was doing some of it. And then he went to America and America, of course, didn't get into World War One until the very end. Um, so he was, but he was running, you know, German sentiment, which is less, I mean, let's be clear, this is World War One, So it wasn't like he was working for the Nazis or anything, <laughs> but, um, you know, he was, it, it was still, uh, you know, he was, he, and he was a double agent, right? He was doing all this to subvert it. And then uh, World War Two, but he did actually play a role in World War Two. Apparently he was, um, supposedly working behind it's a little vague on what he was doing uh it may have been secret and never really come out but it sounds like he was part of kind of a propaganda informational warfare campaign in world war ii um as we said he claimed to have invented the v for victory symbol 
uh, which was very iconic, although some people debate that. Uh, it sounds like he actually met Ian Fleming and uh, Roald Dahl, who were in the same general vicinity uh, during World War II. So there's a chance that they kind of worked together. <laughs> we're not really clear. Um, um, yeah, and, and uh, uh, as we mentioned, I think we mentioned this on the James Bond episode, but uh, uh, Le Chief was supposedly based on Crowley, though I don't see the connection, but that's what who, Fleming Sorry, who claims. was it? Who was uh, Le Chief from... Uh, uh, Casino Royale. Right, right. Le Chiffre, yeah. Uh, uh, which I, mean, I think I, is a little tenuous, but that's what Fleming claimed. Well, I mean, you could argue that he gave rise just to the image of a supervillain in general. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we talked about uh, Dr. Mabuse, uh, but, you know, and he's kind of... But but I think Crowley... I think Crowley is the image we have uh, all through since then of a dark magician who forms an evil cult and who, but it maybe has a, you know, maybe has a respectable, uh, public life, but then in private, semi respectable. On... <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. He wasn't always, it, it depends because when he was wealthy and upper class and he was part of, of his era in the immediate, uh, pre-World War One era, it was, you know, that was what the upper classes were doing. Uh, after World War One, he lost his money, but also he sort of fell into disrepute and became a, like he was addicted to drugs and, and all kinds of stuff. And that, I think you could get away with that when you're rich and hobnobbing with the upper class, you could be addicted to heroin and people wouldn't blink. And then after world war one, I, I think maybe that, and he had no money and it started to be, uh, and, and I think he started to lean heavily, more heavily on the, uh, on the occultism, the Ordo Templo Orientis and, and the various uh, movements that he'd been part of and pitch himself more as a guru post world war one. Like, I think he was more, uh, you know, an interesting crank before World mm -hmm. War One, and then after World War One, he started going. Yes, I'm a mysterious, sinister figure with all kinds of secret. You know, like cult leader esque, a Manson esque yeah. figure, if you will. Although he, of course, didn't kill anyone. Um, um, oh, there's also uh, I wanted to bring up Jack Parsons. You know him? Yes, yes. He was a but rocket scientist ahead, yes. who was a devotee of uh, Crowley's. Right. Um, Anyway, I just like thought he, that, he, was, that was interesting. He he like, met Crowley, right? Like he was, like he yeah, was part yeah, he of his was, circle, uh, right? Yeah, he was put in charge of the California Lodge uh, at Crowley's request, right? At Crowley's bidding, and yeah. then he went, and then he went on to be part of the space program. <laughs> Which yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, um, that's def definitely a character who needs like a movie about him. Jack Parsons, he's kind of a wild person. Um, let's see. Also, um, the early Simon F. stories, the ones set in uh, London, uh, are um featured around something called the Hemlock Club that amused me a lot. Mm. Um, it's sort of, it's a gentleman's club. Uh, in order to get in, you have to commit some sort of, you know, public blasphemy or... Um, a heresy, yes. A heresy, yes. <laughs> you have to say, um, you have to, you know, basically reject the tenets of whatever group or philosophy you're in. Like if you're in the church, you have to start arguing against some aspect of theology or something. Mm -hmm. or and, in, um... It has various uh, rules, like if you uh, quote Shakespeare within their within their halls, you have to pay a certain you have to pay a fine. Right. And uh, Simon F's guest uh, for the night uh, goes in, seeing all these rich you know people. He starts uh, just quoting Shakespeare nonstop, and uh, Simon F ends up having to pay like what was it, sixty pounds or something. 95 pounds, which is, yeah. I guess, a lot at the time, right? And the guy's yeah. horrified because they don't want to say the rule out loud, but since he asks, they tell him. Um, um, but Oh, and yeah, there's ahead. also a joke that uh, the uh, Hemlock Club holds that um, uh, the works of Francis Bacon were written by William Shakespeare. <laughs> right. That, and that all really kings named me George are usurpers. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah all, you can see all it, kings named George are usurpers, so... Um, yeah, they just refer to you know King George the first as the usurper King George the first. Yeah, referring back to uh, the Eye in the Pyramid show we did about the Illuminatus trilogy, um, they uh, uh, Shea and Wilson had clearly read Crowley and knew about him because they literally called the the secret organization the AA. I don't know how you pronounce that, but yeah, that was... I don't know. Um, I list uh, one of the times I uh, read the Illuminatus trilogy, I listened to it as an audio book. And they pronounced it by spitting, like the three eight, dots spitting eight. them. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, it's a little triangle of dots basically after each yeah. day. Um, but that was the name that uh, Crowley gave to his organization as well. If yeah, I'm not and it's uh, it's really unclear what it stands for. You know, intentionally right. secretive. 
Well, and this is where I see when you describe the Hemlock Club and you describe a lot of the stuff Crowley did with his organizations and stuff, it's deliberately absurd. It's deliberately yeah. subversive and ridiculous, just as it is in the Illuminatus trilogy. They're trying to essentially mentally, you know, mentally dislodge you from your habits and from your your old modes of thinking and and open your mind, man. Um, yeah. And that's the thing that I think the hippies in the 60s really latched onto and then all the counterculture uh, movements later. It's sort of like a, a Cohen in, in Buddhism, the, um, a paradox right. sort of thing. Right, yes, exactly, yeah. And he was into Buddhism as well, obviously. So, yeah, it's uh, like a lot... That's why it's hard to say what to take seriously of Crowley yeah. and whatnot. Even in the Simonist stories, which are pretty straightforward, uh, you have a sense... Like, there's a lot of sort of witty irony and, and uh, subversion and stuff, and you, you sometimes wonder, you know, what... You know, what what moral lessons are we supposed to take from the Simon of <laughs> stories? Maybe there is no real moral lesson here. You know, oh, he does it, say at one point that the only reason he's solving crimes is to keep his brain sharp. So, right, exactly. No, I mean that he has that in common with Sherlock Holmes, right? Um, um so uh, Crowley's appeared as we've mentioned. He's all over pop culture, like directly, right. like as a character. He was he was on the Venture Brothers. He was apparently mm. on Pennyworth. The uh, well, Alan Moore, literally, when he wrote Century, he used Oliver Haddo, which is the uh, Somerset Mom character, who was a pseudonym of Crowley, but then he kept jumping from body to body. Um, he ended up uh, becoming the villain who was in an episode of The Avengers, the, the 60s British show, The Avengers, who was kind of a satanic uh, cult leader, who was obviously, again, clearly based on Crowley. Yeah. Yep. But it is an interesting point just to sort of, he's basically tracing one of the things, because of course Alan Moore is obsessed with Crowley, um, he's sort of tracing Crowley's uh, um, significance throughout the 20th century by having him literally keep jumping into new bodies and oh, yeah. becoming all these one historical of the characters. things was him uh, um, wanting to uh, inhabit the body of uh, the Rolling Stones analog in the story. Which, right, uh, yes. Mick Jagger yeah. was into Crowley and, yeah. Apparently, Crowley appeared in an episode of uh, Pennyworth, the show about Alfred, Batman's butt. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. It, again, um, if they're reading... Like, uh, sure Martha don't... Wayne goes to one of Crowley's parties in the 60s. He was actually dead in the 60s, but the show's sort of, you know, like, mashup of time periods, apparently. But they make him l explicitly Aleister Crowley? Yeah, I think they name him that. Um, I haven't seen it, but it says that on the Wikipedia. Huh. Thing. Interesting. Interesting. Um... Okay, uh, we should wrap it up. We've actually, yeah, you mentioned you mentioned that. Yeah, I think the Simon F stories make it explicit that he is a guy who works on people's psychology and pretending to have magical powers is a way of doing that, um, and that also you know he believes he's tapping into some higher thing that we don't quite understand. But he's not necessarily saying I can throw a fireball at you or whatever. He's saying. Or even I can cut summon a demon to kill you, which is something only evil magicians would do anyway. Uh, he's saying, you know, he he, had, he I think he understood that he could have a an impact on people's lives by using magic, essentially. But like, yeah. it's, it's well, a psychological he also defined thing. magic as taking an action to create an outcome. So right, you know, like you can well, perform say, magic I... without you know mm -hmm. doing any spells or things like. Uh, Magic can be just, um, I'm having trouble thinking of an example, but anything you could do is magic, potentially. Well, as you say, I mean, the, the fact that Simon F. basically gets a villain to, to kill himself by just planting an idea in his head, I'd, I'd say that's a good example of what Crowley was going for, basically. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he, he built himself, I mean, let's face it, he managed to make himself useful <laughs> to the British uh, government just by being, yes, I'm a mysterious, mystical guy, and they kind of people, so people turn to him from that. So it's a self fulfilling prophecy in some ways, right? So, mm -hmm. anyway, uh, we should wrap it up. We've actually gone way over our usual uh, thing. Uh, oh, did you want to plug anything special? Yeah, I have a webcomic called The Apex Society. Um, As always. Yeah. Read it. You can also buy it, but it's also free. But it's on Comixology, you right? Know, please buy it. And yep. uh, yeah, it's on it's online. But yeah, if you want to read an issue, and this covers a lot of the same. It's it's his it's Philip's version of the the uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, um, basically. Uh, that's a big influence. Yes, I, I'd say it's a. I use more original characters. Uh, like it's a mix of uh, public domain, you know, actual history uh, and original characters who are clearly based on 
analogs for things. Um, well, right. uh, in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it's more like, this is James Bond, you know? But they just don't <laughs> name him that, but it's clearly, you know, that's the character. Anyway. Um, but it's your tribute to pulp, basically. Yeah, and, and, and pulp and various other genres. Uh, the current arc is about uh, Robert E. Howard type, you know, Conan and Cole stories. Right. So uh, it's a tribute yeah, to that exactly. sort of thing. Oh, and Elric. Yeah. To well, yeah, well, that's all coming out of the Robert E. Howard era, basically. Um, yeah, but the, yeah. the sword and sorcery, uh, pre-Tolkien sword and sorcery swashbucklers, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so there's a, a Kickstarter running at the moment um, uh, by uh, my friend DM Elms is running a Kickstarter for uh, a comic that she'd like to write called uh, Crash, The Adventures of Crash Girl and Sparkle which is a, a kid's comic, kid's superhero comic. Um, it's kind of a riff on sort of various old, older comics, Harvey and Star type comics. Um, and it's it would be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm tapped as the artist, so we're trying to uh, raise money for that. And uh, if if that sounds interesting to you, uh, by, the, by all means, please look it up on Kickstarter and please donate. Oh, uh, also... Uh... This, I mean, it's it's on topic, so you might as well plug uh, um, Star Force Pentacle as well. That's right. Yes, I do a webcomic called Star Force Pentacle, and actually, yes, it deals with a lot of the ideas which are now being focused by having read more of Crowley, and it feels it makes me feel like I was on the same track as Crowley because some of the ideas I put in Star Force Pentacle are somewhat similar to Crowley's. Um, but it's at uh, you know, if you go to Fantastic Tales with a PH, uh, you can read uh, it's. There's a link to it there. Um, if you go to fantasmictales.com or just Google Star Force Pentacle. Uh, you can find my uh, my comic online, or follow me on Twitter at prankster36, and I link to it all the time. As and Philip saw it uh, spear half uh, underscore on Twitter, and uh, I also post at phantasmictales uh, on Twitter P- with a ph again. Um, well, that's it for this week. We are Adam Prosser, the great high exalted sorcerer supreme, and Philip Rice, the great beast from out of the flaming void between realities. We want to thank. Bye. Him- Hi! <laughs> we want to thank... Bye, Great Beast! We want to thank engineer, producer, and master of the Tao, Alex Ross. And the, th- the theme song was by Jack Furick, the small, still voice of the soul. Until next time, keep your mind and heart in balance, and your love under your will, where a can get a moment's notice.